If death is to be gained, Christ must be more precious to you than everything you leave behind. And when a person dies like that, the world looks on and says, this Christ must be valuable. I wish you life, man. Good morning, gentlemen. We're going to go ahead and get started. Glad that you're here today. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer in just a moment, but before I do that, let me share a couple of words of announcement with you just about other things going on with our men's ministry here at Capitol Hill. We have a fishing tournament on the 22nd. If you want more information, we can get you that. There's probably a sign-up sheet and some information on our men's ministry table. And if it's not there, we'll, we'll find it out if you want to know about it. Uh, softball is being played by some of our men, and they're always open to some other guys coming out and being a part of that. So if you want to know more about that, we we'll put you in touch with Jason Crosby. So if you know Jason, contact him if you want to know some information about softball. If, uh, if you don't know Jason, but you'd like to know something about playing softball with us, we'll get we'll get you in touch with him. And, uh, you, can, you can get involved in that as well. I understand that uh, our men's basketball group is on a break for now, so uh, that, that's on a break right now. But uh, if you're interested in doing that later, See Shane Robb, talk to him, and he can be hooked up there. Let me pray for us this morning, and for those of you that are new, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Those of you that are back, welcome back. It's good to be started back this fall. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for these men that have gathered this morning, gotten up, changed their routine. Thank you that, Lord, they have an interest in looking into your word this morning knowing something about what it says related to uh, their manhood and ministry and life. Pray, Father, that uh, our time together would yield fruitful results, that we would uh, be challenged to be more like Christ, we would make commitments to that end, and that, Father, uh, we bear fruit in our, in our homes, in our marriages, in our workplaces, in our relationships. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If, if you're just getting here or if you got here and, and walked by the table and didn't pick up uh, a book like this, uh, this will have the schedule in it and it'll have pages for you to take notes in. If you don't need any of that, you don't need the book. Uh, but if you want that, if that becomes helpful to you, then we do that, make that available. Kind of keeps all the notes for the study together. Uh, so that as you come week to week, uh, all the all the notes and thoughts from this study are in one spot. It does give you the schedule. That's helpful as a reminder to you. Uh, as you figure out your own schedule, you'll know what's going on, what's coming up. So uh, that will be beneficial to you, I believe. And uh, those of you that don't know, we have video rolling. That's okay. Don't worry about coughing or getting up and leaving if you need to or anything like that. But, we record what's happening on Tuesday morning uh, video so that on Thursday night and Saturday morning, the groups that gather will watch that video. And that way they, they have the teaching there and then they have their small group. So uh, it's beneficial to them and, and thankful for the groups that meet on those days as well. Today's September 11th, isn't it? Let's stop again a moment and, and pray for our country uh, as we think about September 11. Uh, let's pray together. Father, we come before you today uh, as we think about uh, this day and, and what it means now in our country. Lord, we know that there are people that uh, are, are still uh, suffering from that day suffering the loss of loved ones, uh, some probably still suffering from living through that ordeal either as a survivor or a rescue worker. Uh, Lord, it is a, a reminder to our country of how fragile the world is, how susceptible uh, 
people are to evil. But Lord, more than that, it's a reminder, ought to be a reminder to us as believers to pray that our nation would repent. God, I, I know that following the events of September 11, many people looked and turned to you for answers. And uh, there was a, a small movement of, of our nation thinking about its spiritual foundations again, and thinking about God again. I pray that we would return to that. Apart from another tragedy happening, I pray, Father, that our, our country would turn to you that there would be a somber repentance that today as people reflect upon the fact that there are evil people in our world that want to harm other people, that it would, it would cause us not to turn simply to our nation for national defense, but to our God for spiritual help. Lord, we do that today. We seek your face. We ask on behalf of our nation that you'd be merciful, yes. the Lord, that you'd be patient, yes. and that God, people would come to their knees yes. and repent before you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Yes. The study we're going to do is called Waste Management, Living the Strategic Life. Um, the, uh, the studies are going to come from, from two different books, and um, pastors and I are not going to try to just give you a book report, but we want you to know that uh, the, the thrust of each session is, is coming out of one of these two books. And the, the first portion of those comes out of a book called Don't Waste Your Life uh, by John Piper. Uh, some of you have read or seen that. This, this book was driven by a series of uh, meetings that occurred with uh, primarily college-age students called Passion. Some of you may have heard the Passion Movement. Uh, led by Louis Giglio and others. John Piper was a thrust behind that. Uh, but out of, out of those things uh, came a series of writings that uh, became this book, Don't Waste Your Life, by John Piper. Several of these chapters are going to be used to kind of, kind of give a theological thrust to what we're talking about when we, we're talking about the unwasted life or living the strategic life. Okay? Um, so that's going to kind of be our theological basis. You don't need to buy these books and read them. Okay? If you want more information, you want to you want to broaden what you hear here. Hear here. That's good. Uh, buy the books and read if you want to. Uh, but that's one. The other uh, is going to be more the practical side. So we're going to lay a theological basis uh, related to this, and then we're going to try to get some practical assistance at the end of the study, the last few weeks of the study. And they're going to come from a book called Do Hard Things. Do Hard Things was written by two teenagers, Brett and Alex Harris. They're the sons of Josh Harris. Uh, some of you remember that we've used books by C.J. Mahaney. C.J. Mahaney started a church called Covenant Life Church uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. And his successor, a man that he mentored, discipled, became his successor was Josh Harris. Josh's sons uh, wrote this book. Josh uh, would the book most familiar to many of you uh, that he wrote would be um, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. And uh, so some of you may have read, if you have teenage boys or girls, read that. Have them read that. Uh, but those are, those are books that may be helpful to you. If you read Do Hard Things, uh, it's, let me tell you, it's written by teenagers to teenagers. Um, but the principles in there of uh, attacking the Christian life and just realizing that they're the basics of Christianity are hard, no matter what age you are. Uh, they, they come across as, they're really not hard, but they come across as hard to us. And so um, they're trying to knock down some of those obstacles to mediocrity uh, among teenagers, especially in the Christian life. So both of those could be valuable resources to you, but they will not be necessary for you to be in attendance, that you're reading chapters and trying to stay ahead and, and all of that. Just know that's where... Uh, the thrust is coming from for us as we prepare to teach. Mark, okay? They can uh, download the Piper book for free on our website. You got that. Right. Okay, I knew they worked on it. I didn't know if it was there. Uh, did you hear that? On our website, you can download the Piper book, Don't Waste Your Life, PDF file, uh, right from our website. So, 
Uh, it's under the Men's Ministry tab. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to read it there, download it from there. You can do that. Thank you, Shane. That's good. All right. Um, that's still kind of announcement stuff. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll say one other thing. At the end of our time together, large group, we'll go into small groups. And if you're new, we encourage you to stay and be in a small group if you can. Some of you I know have to leave. When we're done, you've got to get out of here. If you, if you can't stay, let me just encourage you that try to find another one of the men that's in this group. Have breakfast with them. Have lunch with them. Uh, meet together with them at least occasionally and discuss some of the teaching. We, we really think the fruitful time of our, our men's ministry Bible studies is when it gets discussed. Um, it's, not, it's not the teaching. The teaching is necessary. We, we enjoy it. We want to bring it. But it's, it's sitting down and discussing that with some other men and kind of feeding on that for a few moments that I think it begins to root itself in you and you can you can begin to live it out. So do that. Well, waste management, living the strategic life. We can probably all think of people, an example of someone who's wasted their life, uh, whether it's a celebrity or a sports star that had everything going for them, they were doing everything right, they were top of their world, uh, materialistically very successful, uh, and yet their life takes a tragic turn because of their own choices and the consequences related to those. Or a family member that uh, has chosen one bad path after another. They end up landing themselves in the poor house or the jailhouse, maybe just the cemetery. And, and we're looking at that life and we're going, my goodness, it was wasted. It was wasted. We probably all think of examples of that. I can think of celebrity and sports examples. I have examples of it in our own family that we just know they had all the right parts in place to be able to not only live a good life and do good by themselves, but to walk with Christ and serve Him. And they haven't done that. If you think about the scriptures, Judas becomes, I think, the premier example of a wasted life. A man who had the opportunity to walk in the inner circle of Jesus Christ, be part of his teachings and his ministry, and carry forward with that. And we know how Judas' life ends in a tragic way. If you look further back in the scriptures of the Old Testament, I think about King Saul. Here's King Saul going to be the first king of this new nation, Israel. He is described as handsome above everybody else, taller than everybody else. He's, he's a dominant figure. He now has at his disposal a great influence. And yet, out of greed and dishonesty and covetousness, he wastes his life. He wastes his life. John Piper... So the opposite of wasting your life is living by a single, God-exalting, soul-satisfying passion. The opposite of wasting your life is living by a single, God-exalting, soul-satisfying passion. That comes right out of the book that we were talking about a moment ago. The unwasted life. The life that is lived strategically, the life that captures those things that could be waste and begins to manage it in such a way that they can focus it, hone it, use it, so that it becomes, in his words again, a single, God-exalting, soul-satisfying passion. I wonder for you, and you can answer this question for yourself, what wakes you up in the morning? What gets you up every morning? What is it that's giving you motivation for each day? Is there a God-exalting, soul-satisfying passion that burns inside of you? Are, you? are you getting up because it's the routine to get up? I mean, it's, the alarm's going off again. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to go to work again. We've got to keep the paycheck coming in. We've got things to do this evening. I've got to get through this to get to that. 
or is there something that's driving your heart? And and the and everything else is is kind of there, and 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 it needs to be there, but it really is providing for you a platform to do something that's your soul satisfying passion. My question in thinking that way is: is that even possible? Is it is it possible to to really live a life that becomes a single? It's an exclusive word, by the way, isn't it? Single. We don't think in terms of single much in our life. I'm not talking about marriage right now, guys, okay? Uh, we, we don't think single much. I, I remember as a, as a kid in Border, Texas, when we went to get ice cream, uh, there was Dairy Queen, all right? And it was going to be a soft serve cone. All right. That was that. There was a single option <laughs> to ice cream. Okay. When Brahms opened in Border, Texas, uh, it was amazing. I mean, people were so excited. All right. All of a sudden, there was ice cream options. Okay. And we and we always think now. There's lots of options. There's there's always the the opportunities are broad and expansive. Is it possible to to live our life and have a single God exalting, soul satisfying passion. Is that possible? Or is that the stuff that dreams and movies are made of? I mean, that somebody kind of can take everything and hone it down to a single and drive drive that to completion for their whole life and, and their whole life becomes a focused shot. Uh, like a rifle being shot over a long distance. Or is the reality just simply that my life's got to be a shotgun blast? Just, I'm going to be scattered and I'm going to be everywhere. And I hope some of those land on a target that is somehow God-exalting and soul-satisfying. But really, life's going to be just a blast into space. And you may be thinking, well, that'd be nice, but that's the ideal. I mean, it, the ideal may be possible in moments in time, but it, it's not really possible all the time. It's kind of like perfection in the scriptures. You know, we read that, be ye perfect as I am perfect. Well, great, Jesus. Uh, I'm not going to get there till heaven, so it's a good goal to shoot for. But I don't really expect to get there now, so I, I'm not going to stress over that too much. I'm not going to think about it really. Uh, I, I know it's the goal, uh, but is that what the single life focus is talking about? I, I mean, here's the thing: as I was preparing my notes for this morning's message to you, okay. I received a text message about a meeting I have today. Responded to that. I tried to send two emails and discovered our server was down and checked on that. Paused to think through a meeting that uh, I was having later that day. Returned a phone call about something that's going to happen next week. I went through a text conversation with a former student that's now a colleague and he's going to be visiting Oklahoma City and he was contacting me to see if we could get together and we went back and forth multiple times. My mind wandered off to my son's football game that happened last night and I began to think about things related to a junior high football game and how important that's going to be in his life. I thought about a meeting I had this morning later, a funeral that I'm attending later today. I mean, all those things were happening while I was trying to prepare the notes to talk to you about having a single focus. All right, that's, I mean, it, it, that's where we're living our life, right? Uh, we all have work, and we have leisure activities, and we have relationships, and, and we've got eating to do, and taxes to pay, and some of you in the younger stage of life still have diapers to change, and cars that need to be worked on, and things in the home that need to be mended, and then there's the real world. There's a war, and there's elections, and there's our family, and there's holidays coming, and you know, life is lived broadly. Is there really something big enough and deep enough to hold all of that together, to pull up all, all of those things and all of life and all that's happening? Is there something that can pull all of that and hold all of that together and bring it into single focus? Is that really possible? Boasting only in the cross, that's the subject. 
Matthew 22, 37. Consider a couple of verses with me, right? Matthew 22, 37. Jesus speaking, when we read this, most of you will probably be familiar with the story behind it. Uh, Jesus is being questioned by one of the lawyers from the Sanhedrin. <laughs> lawyer in this day, not being like a lawyer in our day, a lawyer, somebody who was studied in the law of God. Matthew 22, 37. Hey, ask Jesus the question. What's the, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus answered to the question of this. He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Single focus. Singleness. Calls for an undivided heart toward God. Is that really possible? Is Jesus speaking something that's really possible? Or is he speaking hyperbolically to grab attention? <coughs> So that we move from where we are going, well, God's part of my life to I want God to be an important part of my life. Consider this verse. Revelation 3.16. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Jesus speaking to one of the churches in Revelation. We know that the language behind that is more than I'll spit you out of my mouth. It's a vomiting up something that's so distasteful and so disgusting that your body absolutely rejects it and, and disgusts it. You're lukewarm. And, 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 and the verse isn't about this. It's not about good people are hot and bad people are cold and Jesus wants to be, just choose to be good or bad, just choose one or the other, that's not what it's about. It's about the hot and cold are obvious things, right? You know when there's hot water, you know when there's cold water. It's, it's obvious and it's clear. Uh, and, and lukewarm, tepid water in Jesus' day would have been something that would have absolutely been nauseating and disgusting and caused violent vomiting, uh, as it would be today if we were out in the woods and found some tepid water and began to drink it. Uh, but in his day, if you could get the water hot or if it was cold and fresh, it was good for you and could be useful. And he's saying you, you need to be in a state of usefulness to the kingdom of God. Otherwise, you're something that for God is something that needs to be absolutely rejected. Is that hyperbolic? Is the church straining at something impossible? When we talk about the single focus, single purpose, live your life for a soul-satisfying, God-exalting passion, are we straining at something and just frustrating people by kind of continually calling them to that? Sunday school teachers and pastors are standing up and, and trying to drive us to you know, get your life focused, live for Christ, zeal for Him, nothing else matters. Is that just frustrating everybody else? It's not really possible, but it's just something that they continue to drive at and push for so that it gets a little better over time, but it's never going to really get there. And ultimately, it's just frustrating and maybe even running people away. Should the church just realize that life is busy and full of commitment to other things and full-time commitment to Christianity is feasible only for pastors, missionaries, and seminary professors? So, leap leave the real people alone. I don't think so. But I do think this. We need to align our thinking about this. When we think about the goal of waste management, living the strategic life, we, we need to realign our thinking. Okay? I think it's possible and I think it's feasible. I think that we have thought so wrongly and poorly and maybe spoken so poorly about it that we're missing what it's all about. How many of you have a smartphone with you today? Or a tablet device of some kind? Or use a computer? Or a laptop? Anybody do those things? <laughs> uh, they're all present in our room right now, right? 
Uh, if you use any of those devices, you know that occasionally you need a system upgrade or it's not going to work. Uh, my kids get frustrated with me when they grab my iPhone or my tablet and they find this new cool game that everybody's playing and they want to get it. And I only do free games, by the way. Uh, and it's free and they can actually, they, I mean, they check that first. Okay, they don't even ask if it's got to be paid for. They don't even come and go, Dad, I really want this game. It doesn't even come up. But it's free, then it's, okay, Dad, can we download this game? You enter your password so we can get this. And we go through that process. And then it says, you need to upgrade to the latest iOS software uh, before you can download this game. And they're like, oh, man, Dad, you haven't done And I'm really poor at doing that. I mean, I, I, I see them come through, and I'm like, uh, it's going to mess something up. I'll just stay with where I'm at. You know, it's working right right now, and I don't want to go through that. So I, you know, the, the cautious side of me, sometimes you need the system upgrade so that everything, we need a system upgrade as we think about this, okay? We need, to, we need to realign our thinking. We need a system upgrade as, as we think about, okay, rifle shot or shotgun, uh, weights management, living strategically, single focus. What are we going to do, okay? Since my teen years, I've listened to preachers and evangelists and at Christian camps, rallies, concerts, revivals, call out, push upon Christians, students, you need to get serious, you, 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 you need to sell out, you need to burn hot, you need, it, it's got to be about Jesus. And, and they've pushed and they pursued it, and I've heard all those things. And generally what that's followed up with is a laundry list of things that need to be given up so Christ can become first. Right? I mean, it's got to be Jesus and nothing else and so, if you're in this, you need to give it up. If you're in this, you need to give it up. If you're doing this, you need to give it up. If your hobbies take more time than your Bible reading, they need to go. I mean, let's face it. How many of you play golf? Can you play golf in 15 minutes? I can't. I probably should and be done, but I can't. Um, and that's probably about the average time somebody committed to Bible reading spends in their Bible. So should golf go? I spend more time when I go out and golf than I do. I mean, if I golf once a week and read my Bible every day, I still spend more time golfing. Golf's got to go because I obviously love golf more than I love Jesus. If your kids are watching more TV than you pray, you need to kill the cable. Right? I mean, come on. TV's on and you're not praying? Give me a break. You don't love Jesus. Right? These are the kinds of things that we hear in these settings. That's the kind of focus that comes to that. And we walk away feeling really guilty about things, but again going, the guy didn't even realize that life's a shotgun. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just splattered all over the place. How do, I, how do I get all that in focus? You just you eliminate all the other shot that's not the one that hits the target? Is that, is that what he's saying? If your car radio is on the sports animal more than on Christian contemporary station, then sports has become your god, right? Uh, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. You get the idea. I can give you other examples. We need a system upgrade. Your mind being captured to Christ, your passion being brought to a single focus, is not just about ridding things from your life. It's about bringing it all in focus, something under something more magnificent and more powerful. It's about bringing all these things that our life, and then being captured by something that's larger, deeper, stronger. Is there anything that can bring cars, kids, jobs, taxes, sex into a God-exalting, soul-satisfying passion? Is there something that can do that? Turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. Apostle Paul's writing to this church in Corinth. He says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul is not a simpleton. Remember, Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrew, a Pharisee of Pharisees. 
He had to be well versed, well studied in the law. That means as a child he had memorized the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Some of you won't read the first five books of the Old Testament, all right? He had memorized that. I mean, he has studied and learned and understood those things that he had read and studied and memorized as a child. He wasn't a simpleton. And yet when he spoke to this church, when he spent time among this church, when he wrote to this church, he says to them, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul was so captivated by his own salvation that all of a sudden nothing else mattered. Paul still lived, he still ate, he still traveled, he still had conversations, he still had friendships and relationships. But he said, all of those things are brought under an umbrella of something that is more magnificent and more glorious and more powerful, that gives them focus, that gives them drive, that gives them energy. I want to know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Our lives will not gather more meaning or more joy if we get better jobs and better homes and nicer cars and better relationships or more friendships or deeper friendships or a friendship with the right kind of people or if we meet our financial goals or we improve our relationship with our wives. There are Christians running around saying to themselves, I could be a better Christian if I could figure out how to have a better relationship with my wife and if I could figure out how to manage my finances better and if I could do this a little differently and if I could do... None of those things are going to make you more happy or more joyous or a better Christian. When you become single-focused with a God-exalted passion, then all those other things will be captured and become better. But they're not going to be the driving force. The cross reminds us that every beat of our heart, every breath in our lungs, every discussion with our wives, every meeting at the office, every trip to the gas pump, every whining moment from our kids is a gift. All of those things are a gift because we all deserve to die upon our first sin and be cast into eternal judgment. And yet God in gracious mercy because of the cross of Christ has given us a gift that includes all of those things as a life. The cross has provided an ongoing earthly existence with the opportunity to use even the drinking of our orange juice to bring Him glory. In a passionate pursuit of the cross. As well as, not just this life, and all those things coming into focus. As well as a future without sin, without sorrow, without pain. Reigning as a prince of the greatest king in all of creation. It's not just about getting stuff out of the way. The, the single, God-exalting, soul-satisfying passion of your life isn't about eliminating everything else but Jesus so that you are a modern-day monk. And some Christians think that's the goal. I've got to figure out how to live monkishly in this secular existence and have no contact in anything that would be worldly or touch upon this thing, rather than thinking like the apostle who said, I came among you with all this stuff, my life, and I just determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The cross became the focal lens. We are at the football game last night watching these junior high kids play. There's all these people with these cameras, right? A camera we use is a point and shoot and, you know, our cell phone. And that's probably not really <laughs> great enough to capture the moments of life, but it's working. Well, there's these people with these cameras with these huge lenses on them where they can just focus right. I mean... You know, they're getting facial expressions through the face mask of their kid. 
you know, during the game. It's amazing. What is that doing? It's taking that whole event and bringing it into a focus on something. It doesn't eliminate everything else that's there. But it focuses it. That's what the cross does in our life when we get it right. Not when we tack it on. Not when we say, well, there's all this stuff and the cross. And, and not even when we say, well, okay, it's going to be about Jesus, and my job isn't about Jesus, so I've got to change jobs. And my wife doesn't love Jesus, so I've got to change wives. And uh, my car doesn't have a Jesus fish, I've got to go get one. And, right? It's bringing the cross into our life in such a way that we say, you know what? Uh, my job may be secular, but it gives me a platform about Jesus going to bring focus to why I get up and go to this job. My family needs the focus of the cross. My life needs the focus of the cross. It brings it all into focus. It's not just about getting stuff out of the way. Let me ask you a question. Which one of these is the waste? You've heard the story about Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Pete Fleming, Roger Guderian, five, two other guys, five missionaries, uh, go out into the jungle. They're in their 20s. They are college graduates, young marrieds, young dads. They are skilled pilots. At least one of them was. Uh, they are preachers. They have all this life potential, all this life opportunity, and they all went, you know what? We're going to go live in the jungle, we're going to live in huts, and we're going to go try to find these people that uh, are still native. They've never seen civilized life. When they have, all they've tried to do is destroy it, and we're going to try to take the gospel to them. And in the attempt to do so, they walk into the jungle and are slaughtered. Is that a waste? a waste. How about how about the couple that Piper in his book writes about read a story about a couple that at age 59 the man was able to take early retirement and wife was only 51. They took their early retirement. They lived in the northeast. They decided they would move to Florida. Punta Gorda, Florida. And they moved to Florida 59 and 51 they spend their days sailing on their 30-foot trawler, playing softball, and collecting seashells. Is it a waste? Which one's the waste? The slaughter of five young men who are burning hot with a passion for Jesus. And the story ends before they reach 30. Or showing up at heaven and going, God, are you happy with my seashells? <laughs> Look what I collected. Which one's the waste? I'm not going to give you the answer. <laughs> Look at it in the light of the cross. Boast only in the cross. That's, that's the subject. You're all familiar with Philippians 3. 7 and 8, I bet. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Still the Apostle Paul, still thinking single focus, God-exalting passion, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost and be of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. See, that's, that's part of the problem. We're talking about waste management. Are you able to evaluate your life and see what's rubbish and what's not? What brings the focus? What helps in aiding you to the cross, keeping the cross central, keeping the cross focused, keeping the cross all that you boast in? Are you, able to, are you able to evaluate those things and go, rubbish, rubbish, rubbish? Not 
again, it's not about eliminating things. It's about being able to see those things that aid and push you to the cross and what the cross can bring focus upon and those things that are extra. Okay? That to the eternal thing just aren't valuable. Not that maybe even in this life they're not important, but the eternal things are not valuable. I mean, Paul's talking about the fact that his training was rubbish. Was it really rubbish? It trained him. It, it, he wrote later that the law is a tutor to Christ. It, it's, it's not that it's, it's nothing, but once it gets in the way, it's extra. It's extra. I'm able to get my focus off of that and focus where it ought to be. Everything that doesn't aid him in knowing Christ becomes rubbish. Everything that aids me in knowing Christ and walking with Christ is where my value is. Listen, we're talking about God exalting single focus. Does that mean I'm not going to spend time with my wife and my kids? They've taught me more about the cross than a lot of other things in this world. I mean, being married has taught me a lot about my need for Jesus. All right. <laughs> Uh, can I get an amen on that? Uh, kids, wow, you want to learn repentance? <laughs> have to kneel at the foot of your child's bed and go, I am so sorry. I was a sinner right in front of you today when I lost my temper or when I responded that way to that situation. I, I, sin. That's right. That'll drive you to the cross, okay? How do we begin to tighten that focus on the cross so it comes in more clarity? I think it's, it boils down to education on the cross. I think a lot of times as Christians, we think the cross is what gets us to Christ, and then we walk away from it. We walk to the cross, and uh, you can almost see it, those of you that grew up in Baptist youth groups, uh, you, you at some point brought your sin to a cross and laid it there or nailed it there or put it in a bucket or hung it on. I mean, you did something with sin you wrote or carried or symbolized and put it at a cross. And you can almost, you take your sin to the cross and then you walk away and you go be like Jesus. And symbolically, that's such a horrible image for all of us. And yet it's probably burned in our brains. For the Christian, you never leave the cross. You never leave the cross. Uh, you get to Jesus through the cross and you carry the cross. Isn't that what it means to be a Christian? Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Never leave the cross. It's always got to be there. It's always got to be the focus. Everything comes there. And the more I've lived the Christian life, the more I've realized that I need the cross more now than I did in that instant when I realized I'm a sinner. And Jesus, the stories I've heard, the things, it's real, it's true, and that's all that saves. And I get that. And I need that. I need to cross more now than I did then. I need it more now. When I leave the cross, everything becomes confusing. When I, when I think I'm ready to move beyond the cross or try to live with, okay, I, I get the cross thing, Jesus. Give me the bigger stuff, the deeper stuff. I need more. And then I get caught up in thinking my thoughts and my ideas are right. I, I become more selfish. I get self-focused. I get boastful. I get arrogant. I'm doing this thing. I'm making these things happen. I'm beginning to grow. I No, we need to cross. So how do we maintain a God-exalting, soul-satisfying passion? How do we do that? One other verse. It's right there close to Philippians, it's in Galatians, just back up a little bit. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. How do I become a cross boaster? How, how, do, I, how do I develop a single passion of God exalting, soul-satisfying passion. How do I do that? How do I maintain that? 
if I'm there or was there at one time, how do I get back there and how do I maintain it? Until we're on the cross ourselves. Until I'm crucified to the world, the world is crucified to me. Until I realize that everything has to come to the cross. To the cross is the perspective of everything that's happening. The cross helps me determine those things that go in the wastebasket and those things that are beneficial to greater clarity. Again, not eliminating, but being able to view the rubbish is in a way it's distracting, it's not helpful. View those things in our life to bring clarity to why. And on the reverse, the cross bringing clarity to those things and how. So is it possible to live a single God exalted? Soul satisfying fashion. Yeah. With that system upgrade, yeah. I think it is. Father, pray for these men. Capture this now. And Lord, whether they're at the front end of life as a man, starting family, raising young family, apart from you coming back quickly or their life ending prematurely, many years ahead. Or they've walked the journey away. They're kind of taking stock of where things have been and, and how they're going to finish. It's possible to take all that has been and all that is and begin to shine it through the prism of the cross so that it brings the focal clarity needed to live whatever years are left for any of us with rifle shot pinpoint accuracy. I pray that for them. I pray that for me. Lord, we won't live scattered, although at times life will be very scattered. But all of those things will live in the light of the cross. Realizing the fact that they we're doing any of those things is because the cross is patience. It's given us life and breath to do so. And we can use it to bring honor and glory to your name. We see it in light of the cross. We live it and do it in light of the cross. And I pray that the study will help us live with that kind of focus. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're going to be in a small group, or you want to take something away just to dwell on a little bit more. Here's some discussion questions for you. I phrase this this way. If a child asks you this question, how would you answer it? I said it that way because most of us want to be honest with children. We might lie to ourselves. Uh, what is the most important thing in life? If a child asks you that question, you want to give them a good, honest answer. What's the most important thing in life? What about the question, why do we exist? You can read Isaiah 43.7 as you consider answering that question. And maybe try to answer it, then read and answer it again. And then in light of that, what does that mean to you? In light of the answer to that, especially gaining the answer from Scripture, what does that mean to you? So just three questions to carry the thoughts for you forward, right? Glad you were here. Hope you have a great day, great week. If you didn't get one of the booklets before, grab one as you go out. If you don't know where to go in a small group, you're not here with a friend or have somebody to point you, we'll gladly point you in that direction, me or one of the other 
pastors. So have a great day.